Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray that you'll use it in our lives tonight. Help me as I preach. I pray that you help us understand these things and uh, use them in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> by the way, uh, the whole time that he was talking about that thing from Acts this morning, I was sitting here thinking, I, I, I was plan we were planning on doing uh, Lord's Supper this morning. And I knew that, and I said, I'm going, I said to myself, on purpose, I'm going to preach short this week. And that was the week that he came up and spoke about preaching long. You see, God just has a sense of humor, you know, that he just, um, we call that providence. You know, the old Puritans used to call that providence, and so there it is. Uh, now I'm going to make up for that, but uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. If we do get to midnight, some of you might jump out the windows, but... <laughs> Um, anyway, well, let's, uh, let's see, I already prayed, so we just got to get into this. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and one, one Sunday in September of 2000, I was watching the Cowboys play the San Francisco 49ers, and uh, they were getting beat because they were the Cowboys. And, uh, and so uh, during the game, 49ers wide receiver Terrell Owens caught a touchdown pass. Now, Terrell Owens did play for the Cowboys after that, but at this point he's playing for the 49ers. He catches a touchdown pass and does a whole lot of crazy celebration. And, he, and by the way, I'm one of these guys. I'm one of these guys that it doesn't bother me when guys celebrate. I'm not, I mean, I, I figure you get to score a couple touchdowns. You're getting millions of dollars. Go ahead and make fun of the guy you beat. That's, that's just the way I look at it. But anyway, um, so I'm not. I hear all these people arguing about you shouldn't. You should act like you've been there before. No way. Just just celebrate. But anyway, uh, so he goes out and he runs out to the middle of the field where there's the big Dallas Cowboys star, and he dances on the Cowboys star. And that, if you're if you've uh, if you're familiar with the Dallas Cowboys at all, that's like sacred ground right there. And so he's dancing on the star, and he's got the football. It's going like this, unbeknownst to him, because he's too busy celebrating. One of the Dallas Cowboys safeties, George Teague, is coming like a truck, and he just tanks him and just knocks him off the star uh, and defends what is revered and sacred territory in was in Texas State. They plowed that under now, but um, anyway, it was it was he was celebrating that or on that star, and that really got up the ire of the home team because he was desecrating their star. Uh, and, and, you know, as Christians, uh, we ought to hold some things sacred and revere them so much that we are stirred to action uh, from that. And, and not, not silly things like football logos. And, and look, I like football and sports as much as the next person, but really it's meaningless. It's, it's just entertainment. Um, but uh, but uh, I, I, uh, I think there are things that we ought to revere so much and hold so sacred that we're moved to action in order to keep them that way. I'm not talking about attacking people or anything like that, but um, there are some things that are sacred. The cross is, is sacred, uh, and, and uh, I think almost our society has gotten flippant with the imagery of the cross. There's crosses all over everything. Um, and, and a lot of people that wear them and display them uh, have no idea why. They just, it's a piece of jewelry. I'm, by the way, I've got no problem if you're wearing a cross piece of jewelry right now. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's great. But a, a lot of people display those things and, uh, and for the wrong reasons. I think we ought to hold the Lord's Supper sacred and, and reverent and, uh, and not be flippant with that. The Apostle Paul teaches that some people were sick and some people had even died because God was judging them in Corinth for how they flippantly treated the Lord's Supper. We ought to hold our church services sacred and, and, and reverent and, and uh, be stirred to action for that. We ought to uh, worship God in, a, in an orderly and, and sacred way and, and, and hold that in high esteem. We ought to hold God's word in, in high esteem. I don't know if, I don't know if you guys 
uh, were taught this way. I remember being in Awana clubs when I was a kid, and of course we were all taught to bring our Bibles to Awana clubs. We had a big assembly in the main auditorium, and me and my friends were goofing around, and I took my Bible and I went whap over his head, and no sooner had I done that, one of the Awana workers had collared me and put the fear of God in me and said, you don't do that with your Bible. And I learned the difference between a regular old book and God's blessed old book. And uh, that was, uh, and, and you know what, it was something that I already knew, but I really needed to be hollered at at that point. Um, and so there, we ought to hold the word of God in, in high esteem and sacred and revere it. But most of all, there's one thing that we really ought to honor and to, and to hold sacred and holy and revere, and that is God's name. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. It is that high and holy name that we carry with us wherever we go. It is that name that Jesus said it was for his name's sake that we'd suffer persecution in this world. It is the high and holy name of God that we ought to most of all revere and hold sacred in our lives and be moved to action by that. We have a duty to the sacredness of God's name. And like I said, when you call yourself a Christian and let people know that you're a Christian, you bear at that point the sacred, native, the sacred name of Christ with you just as a child bears the name of his father and his mother uh, wherever he may go, whether it be to school or to go to work somewhere or hang out in the neighborhood. You bear that sacred name of Christ with you. And because of that, you have a duty to God's name. And I have a duty to God's name. God's people, Israel, were called by his name. When Solomon built the temple and, and uh, dedicated that temple, he began to pray to God and, and he went through a series of several things that he was begging God, if, you, if, if God, if we get carried off into captivity, if we pray towards this temple, will you please hear us from heaven? Uh, and he goes through a whole thing in and, and, and several scenarios, and always the scenario comes down to, if we pray towards this temple, please hear us from heaven. And he comes to that famous verse on revival, Second Chronicles 7, 14. He says, if my people, which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. I will hear from heaven, and I will hear, heal their land. Um, and so he says, they're my people, called by my name. When God brought Israel up out of Egypt, he did it in such a way that his name would be known in all the earth. In fact, in, in Exodus chapter uh, 9 and verse 16, God had sent Pharaoh to Moses, or I said, sent Moses uh, to Pharaoh, and he is telling Pharaoh why Pharaoh even exists, and God is going to do something through Pharaoh to make a name for himself in the earth. In Exodus 9 16, he says, In very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, he's talking to Pharaoh, to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout the earth. And so God, is, God brought Israel out of Egypt for the purpose, uh, of, well, for several purposes, but as far as Pharaoh was concerned, he was saying, it's so my name will be declared uh, all over the, the world. And so uh, when uh, everything Israel said or did from that point on would reflect in this world, upon the name of God. In the Ten Commandments, God addressed two great relationships. One is our relationship with God, and, and the second one is our relationship with our fellow man. And the first four commandments, or the first table of the law, deal with our relationship with God. And because Israel would be God's people, God was very concerned to make sure that they would properly reflect His name on the earth. Now there was a whole lot of other reasons why God wanted them to be holy. Uh, but uh, for, the, for the sake of this commandment, uh, we are dealing with the fact that God wanted his name reflected well of him in this, on this earth. And so God wanted to be clear. 
They were not to abuse or misuse his name. They were not to profane God's name. Uh, on the contrary, they were to revere and to fear that holy name. So God issued the third of ten commandments. As we look into Exodus uh, 20 at the third commandment tonight, I want to address our duty to God's name. We carry it. We bear God's name on our backs. If you played sports in high school, maybe you, you uh, had your name printed on the back of your jersey. Uh, maybe you didn't. I don't know, even, even in soccer, I think uh, we've, we've seen names on the back of jerseys. Uh, just like that, you bear God's name on your, on your back, as it were. And um, we have a duty to that name, and I want to speak to that duty that we have to God's name in principle, then I want to look at some practical ways we can apply that principle uh, and accomplish that duty in, to his name. So Exodus chapter 20, and uh, we're going to focus on verse 7, but let's start in verse 1 just to get back into this. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth, the, the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generation to them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And so as we read that and think about this, uh, what is your duty to God's name as a Christian? What, what is your relationship to that name? What is your duty to it? And here is basically the principle that we must understand. Our duty is this, honor God's name. Now, that's not real complicated, is it? That's not real brilliant, is it? Uh, but it's simple and it is what God wants. It is what He teaches in His Word. Our whole duty toward God's name is to honor God's name. Give it honor. See, uh, here... He says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That is the neg This is all the negative side of it. Uh, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And of course, the Ten Commandments are given in a negative, um, in a, in a negative light. But uh, see, we don't live by just a list of don'ts, do we? Uh, that's... That's not how the Christian life is really designed. And so the, you look at the entire course of Scripture, and I believe it is our duty to honor God's name. God jealously guards His name. That's why it says in the second half of the verse that God will not hold him guiltless that taketh His name in vain. And so uh, He will personally see to the punishment of those who profane it, uh, whether in this life or the next. Psalm 23 and verse 3. The Bible is full of examples of how God is guarding His glorious name and He is guarding the honor of it. And in the 23rd Psalm, the psalmist, of course, is, it wrote that, David wrote that beautiful psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he comes down to the, to the third verse of that psalm and he says, He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Not even necessarily for your sake or mine, for his name's sake. The prophet Ezekiel, I want, to, I want you to hold a, a finger here and flip with me over to Ezekiel chapter 20. All right, Ezekiel chapter 20. The prophet Ezekiel, uh, like Daniel, this is, Ezekiel is uh, a prophet who uh, wrote and prophesied during the time of the exile. In fact, Ezekiel, um, right at the time that, that, the, that, the, uh, the, the, um, that Judah went into, the country of Judah went into captivity in Babylon, Ezekiel is prophesying. And God through him is telling Israel what he's doing and why he's doing it. And, and, uh, and they've lost their country. 
Uh, they're in exile. Uh, Ezekiel is prophesying to people who have lost their homeland, and he's telling them why God did this. And Ezekiel chapter 20 lays out uh, how the Lord punished rebellious Israel because they were polluting his name. He did this to guard his name, and his name is closely tied to his character. He doesn't want his name drugged through the mud. And so finally he had enough. And uh, look at verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 5. And say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel and lifted my, up mine hand, under the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord thy God. That Lord, capital L-O-R-D, is Jehovah or Yahweh. This is the covenant name of the God of Israel. And he's saying, I chose you. You are my chosen people, and I brought you out of Egypt so that you would know, be, know me by this covenant name. And, and he says, you rebelled here. And now I have cast you out of the land. Verse 9, he says, But I wrought. Why? I worked. Why? For my name's sake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. And he says, So I have worked this work where you are now in captivity. I've done this for my namesake, so it will no longer be drugged through the mud by my people. We go down to verse 14, he repeats his phrase, but I have wrought, why? For my namesake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. Um, and so we go down to verse 22, nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my namesake, that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen in whose sight I brought them forth. Verse 39. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye, sir, go ye every one his, uh, go ye serve ye every one his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. Then he's saying, look, if you guys, and this is kind of an ironic statement, God is not really telling them, I want you to serve other idols. Uh, what he is saying is, if that's what you're going to do, go ahead and do it because I'm going to leave you alone. You're no longer going to be known by my name. And he says, because I don't want my name polluted anymore. Verse 44, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O ye house of Israel, saith the Lord God. This is Ezekiel's prophecy to men and women who have been drug out of their homeland and cast into captivity, and he's saying, God did this to you. Why? Because you were polluting his name. And he now has endured it, and he is putting a stop to it, not for your sake, for his name's sake. We uh, flip over to Ezekiel chapter 36. Same prophet, same situation. And he is explaining now, Ezekiel is now explaining uh, for God, to God's people, um, that God is, is going to bring Israel back from captivity. And he's, he's, going to, um, he's going to give them a new heart. He's going to change things. There's going to be a new covenant and it's, it's going to be great. He's going to bring his people back into the land. But he tells them the reason why. And it's not because you guys are such great people. But it is because God is interested in preserving the honor and the majesty and the glory of his name. In Ezekiel chapter uh, 36, and we pick up uh, the narrative in verse 20, and when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name when they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth of his land. And so what he's saying is God's name is still tarnished because everybody's still saying Israel is God's people and they've been removed from their land. And in the heathen mind, that means that God wasn't powerful enough to put a stop to that. And so verse 21 but I had pity on them, my people. No. All right. 
But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. Therefore I said, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and will gather you out of all countries and bring you into their land. So he says, I'm doing this for my name's sake. What is this? He is gathering them out of all the countries and bringing them back to their own land for his name's sake. And he goes on to say uh, in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you with a new spirit will I put within you and I will take Away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you the, and I will give you a, a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And uh, and he goes on, and and we get down to verse thirty-two. He says, "Not for your sakes do I this." You know why he's not doing it for their sake? It's because he's doing it for the sake of his name. And we come down to verse 38. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So, as Ezekiel went into captivity with the people of Judah, he gives these prophecies. The first prophecy we looked at, God is saying, I am doing this for your, for my name's sake, because you've polluted it. And then he tells them, but God is going to bring you back, and there's going to be a new covenant, and God's going to put a spirit within you, and you're going to keep his laws, and he's not doing that for your sake. He is doing that because he is righteously guarding the glory of his name. You know what, you, know, you see the, the connection we're drawing here? God is very interested God is very invested in the holiness and the sacredness and the purity and the glory of His name. Have you ever had someone tell a lie about you? What is the first instinct that you want? What, what's, what really jumps up in your mind that you want to do? You want to clear your name, right? In whatever fashion, I mean, there's a lot of, maybe some of you do it a lot of different practical ways. You want the truth to come out, you want to clear your name. And God, with Israel and Ezekiel, is saying, I am clearing my name. I am jealous for the glory of my name. And so, uh, we, in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 22, uh, the people of Israel had asked God, or asked Samuel to make them a king, so they'd be like all the other nations and Samuel rebuked them, uh, and, and they were afraid, and Samuel gave a promise, though. He said in 1 Samuel 12, 22, For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you His people. So God promised not to forsake Israel, not because they were such great people, but because of His name. His name was attached to His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he would not break that covenant for his name's sake. Um, in Psalm 25 and verse 11, David is asking God, he's praying to God and asking God to preserve him from his enemies, and he's asking God to forgive him of his sins. And he gives God a really good reason to do that. I bet you can't guess what that reason is, right? In Psalm 25, 11, David says, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. David knew to ask God's forgiveness and deliverance from his enemies by invoking the name of the Lord and saying, God, if you'll preserve me and for forgive my sins and help me walk in your ways, that will go a long ways toward, toward uh, representing your name on earth. How does that translate into the New Testament? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, 
What is our duty toward God's name as we bear it? Our duty is to honor God's name. God is invested in the honor of His name. The psalmist said in Psalm 29 in verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's our duty to honor God's name. And to take God's name in vain is the exact opposite of honoring it. And he went all the way back here in Exodus when they had just come up out of Egypt. God wanted to be very clear. You don't misuse. You don't dishonor. You don't lightly esteem my name by taking it in vain. Now, if we're going to understand this completely, what does it mean to take God's name in vain? Well, it has several applications here. Uh, for instance, it means don't swear an oath by God's name falsely. Don't swear an oath and not keep that oath if you swear an oath in the name of the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 12 and, or 19 and verse 12, uh, he gives this commandment, And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord uh, thy God. I am the Lord. And so, uh, swearing falsely is taking an oath and then breaking that oath. Here in America, in a court of law, I don't know, I've never actually been sworn in in court, but you're supposed to say, uh, so, I, I, I'll tell the truth, nothing but the truth, something like that. So help me God, right? And if you perjure yourself in court you, uh, under, that, under that oath, you are in a lot more trouble than contempt of court. You're in trouble for contempt of God. Most people don't realize that. Um, but that was one of the main applications of this third commandment. Don't take an oath in God's name and then not keep it. Don't swear falsely by God's name. In Joshua chapter 9 and verse 19, uh, the, the children of Israel were conquering the land of Canaan and these Gibeonites came in and they said, hey, we've traveled from a long country and we want to make a league with you guys. And Joshua and the elders of Israel swore by the name of the Lord that they would be allies to the Gibeonites. And what do you know, a couple days later they find out, these are our neighbors. And you know what they couldn't do? The whole congregation's murmuring against them saying, let's kill them. And they said, you know what, we swore an oath in the name of the Lord and we can't go back on that. Now, many years later, Saul, King Saul, attacked the Gibeonites and he killed them, most of them, in his zeal for the Lord. And God cursed Israel and put them under a famine in the days of David. And David inquired of the Lord and said, why is it that we're under this curse? Why is there a famine? And God said, because Saul killed the Gibeonites to whom Joshua had sworn in my name that, they would, that Israel would be their allies. And now you guys are experiencing this, this famine. That is how serious it is to swear falsely by God's name. So... Uh, that's one way of taking God's name in vain. The other way of taking God, another way of taking God's name in vain is this, uh, in that, in God is saying, don't make my name profane. And, and he kind of reiterates this in Leviticus 19.12, you should not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, for I am the Lord. Um, to make something profane means really to make it When I was growing up, and there was, a, there was a really, really awesome brand of clothing that only the really well-to-do kids had. It was called Bum Equipment. You guys remember Bum Equipment in the 90s? And if you had a, a, a and the, everything was too big, so if you had one of those tent-sized sweatshirts and it said Bum, and it had, did it have periods that, it was, I think it stood for something, I, I, I hope it wasn't bad. But anyway, I always wanted those, you know, I, and I couldn't afford them, we, we shopped at, uh, a little bit less uh, expensive uh, places than the people who who wore the bum equipment stuff. So I was wearing not bum equipment, and they were, I was wearing LA gear or whatever, and they were uh, wearing bum equipment, you know. And you know what? One day I walked into Walmart, and there in Walmart was bum equipment. And I could afford it now, but I didn't want it anymore. You know why? Because bum equipment wasn't up here anymore. It was down here. 
and it wasn't worth what it was worth before. You know, I hate to, I hate to uh, maybe make an analogy of God's name to bum equipment, but uh, the, the whole idea of how valuable it was is, was just how unattainable it was, in my mind anyway. And, and it all of a sudden became just like everything else. It was just common. And that's what profaning God's name is. Taking it down a notch and making it common like just any other word. Um, common is the opposite of holy. The ancient Israelites became so reverent toward the name of the Lord that they were careful not to pronounce it. And even now, scholars, Old Testament scholars are divided on whether they should pronounce the name Jehovah or if it is pronounced Yahweh. They're not sure. Um, what happens to those who take God's name in vain? What happens when we profane it and take it in vain? Well, it says here in, in uh, Exodus 20 and verse 7, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now in ancient Israel, it was the death penalty to blaspheme God's name. I praise the Lord that we no longer live under the Old Testament law. Amen. But uh, it was very serious. What happens, though? You become guilty in God's eyes. That's what happens. Now, I don't, want, I don't need to elaborate too much on that. Some people like to say, you know, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. And I think that should scare you to death. My judgment means nothing. God can throw you into hell. Uh, or God can, if you're a Christian, God can, can uh, spank you, so to speak, as your father and, and, and uh, really take care of you. You become guilty in God's eyes. God is your judge. God will execute judgment upon the one who profanes his name, whether it is in this life or the next. If you are a Christian who profanes the name of Christ, you are just treasuring up for yourself wrath. Treasuring up for yourself punishment and displeasure of a holy God who, as we have seen would take the nation of Israel and displace them. Why? For the sake of his name. I don't know about you, but I don't want to mess with that. I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to uh, uh, tear that. I, I don't want to step into that hot water. Oh, by the way, even if we are guilty, if we confess our sins, he is Faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and even that forgive, even that kind of a sin, all we do is confess and repent through the blood of Christ. Jesus cleanses us from every sin. So our duty to God's name is to honor it, to make it holy, to revere it. What are some practical ways we can do that? Real quickly, because people are probably ready to lean out the window, but real quickly. Some ways that we can honor God's name. One is honor God's name with honesty. I mean, what is the purpose of saying don't swear falsely? Well, the purpose of that is, hey, there's people who are going to lie. Who are going to, and, and, and one way to get people to believe your lie is to swear on something high and holy. And so Jesus took up and and uh, Jesus actually gives us a commentary. I was looking, on some, looking for some commentaries to read about this third commandment. And guess what? There was someone uh, a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, who wrote the best commentary ever on it. And that was Jesus. Uh, or he spoke it and it was written down. And that's Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. And Jesus said, Again, ye have heard that it has been said uh, by them of old time, Thou shalt not first swear thyself, or swear falsely, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatever is more than these cometh of evil. Jesus says, just let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no, and you don't have to swear at all. And so there's a commentary. Honesty, really, is the only policy. And so he says, he says uh, uh, that's one way we can honor God's name, 
You know, what's a, it would be a really bad reputation for Christians is to be the reputation of dishonesty, of untrustworthiness, of not being men and women of our words. That is, by and by, one of the worst testimonies by which we pro profane God's name and in the, in the, in the uh, language of Ezekiel, pollute God's name on this earth. So honor God's name with honesty. Another way to honor God's name is with priority. Honor God's name with, with a, a, a certain priority. Making it a priority in your life for God's name to be holy. In, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching about prayer. And he's teaching his disciples how to pray. And he says, after, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, first prayer request, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. It wasn't, Lord, please heal my broken pinky, which is nothing wrong with praying for that, but it, that wasn't first and foremost on his mind. Lord, please meet this financial need. Yes, we can bring every need to Christ, but his first priority was this. God, our Father, let your name be holy and sacred in hallowed. And what is the best way for that to happen as you pray? Is for it to be sacred in your life. Honor God's name with priority. Make the sacredness of God's name your priority in life. Later on, the Apostle Paul would write, whatsoever things you, uh, whatever, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. Whatsoever things you do, do all to the glory of God making his name and his honor your priority. Jesus taught his followers how to pray. In contrast to the prayer practices employed by the religious hypocrites of his day, and his model prayer starts out with, Lord, let your, let your name be holy. Another way to honor God's name, and we'll, we'll stop with this, honor God's name with your words. Again, in Matthew, he had said, let your yes mean yes. Say what you mean to say. I, I hear so many times when a famous celebrity will make a gaffe. You know, they will say something. And by the way, uh, uh, when, you, when you speak so much, um, it's not hard to say something dumb. I mean, uh, the, the more volume of words you throw out there, the greater chance there is for you to say something dumb. And so some got, sometimes a public figure will say something pretty bad or, or, or pretty dumb, and they won't think about it. And then later on, they'll issue an apology and say, this does not, what I said does not reflect who I am. And I always think when I say that, yeah, it does reflect who you are. It just doesn't reflect who you want us to think you are. Uh, and, and so what happened is what you are slipped through, and it, it does reflect who you are. Um, and so uh, honor God's name with your words. And Jesus said, let your words mean something. In, um, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, a great piece of advice Paul wrote to the Colossians and said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Is every word you say graceful? I can say no to that, answer, to that question, right? My answer is no. But it ought to be. I ought to honor God's name with my words. Um, of course, the best way you can do that, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so if those words are not in your heart, they're not going to come out your mouth. Ungracious words that tear people down ought to be replaced with words that edify and build up and bring people closer to Christ and honor God's name. So our duty to God's name, which God guards jealously, is honor God's name with honesty, honor it with priority, honor it with words. Now that's not an exhaustive list. That's three things because I'm a Baptist. There's got to be three. Uh, and so uh, there are many other ways which, you, which the Holy Spirit can lead you to honor God's name. And I'll leave, leave off with this one thing. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it 
and is safe. What a holy, what a righteous, what a worthy name. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Instead, let us commit every moment to honoring that holy name. Let's pray.